Okay, awesome. Um, so I won't read through the title again. It's a wordy title, um, but, and I've been introduced. So let me jump right into things here. So before I jump into the specifics of this paper, um, I wanna kind of address, you know, why the focus on artists or arts grads? Uh, and really that's a focus based on intrinsic motivation. You know, kind of where artists differ from other workers is this intrinsic motivation piece. If we're thinking about how people are motivated, um, some motivation comes from within, that's intrinsic motivation. Um, some motivation is external, that's extrinsic. You know, if we're thinking about workers, extrinsic motivation may come from pay. You know, you are doing a job because you're getting paid to do so. Um, but intrinsic motivation may come from a passion to do the work that you're doing. You know, and if we think about most workers that we encounter in the workforce, uh, often the primary motivation is extrinsic. You know, I give an example here of retail and food workers. You know, if I talk to the worker at the local grocery store, my guess is, you know, the teenager that's working that job is probably there because they're being paid. I doubt they have a passion for doing, you know, grocery store work, right? Um, if we think about how artists behave, a lot of our theoretical models uh, posit that artists are primarily motivated intrinsically. That motivation is coming from within. Uh, artists, athletes, some other workers you know, are motivated by their love for their work. Yes, they need to make a certain amount of money to survive, but you know, beyond meeting these basic needs, um, the motivation of these workers is uh, intrinsic. And if we look at a lot of the literature that is focused on the careers of artists and arts majors, one of the consequences of this intrinsic motivation is that we see a labor market with a lot of kind of bad characteristics. Um, the, the precarious labor market might be the term here, um, in part driven by compensating differentials. Because the workers enjoy their work, they may be willing to uh, accept kind of worse work conditions. And if we look at some of the literature, artists tend to have low average incomes, high level of, of unemployment relative to other similar workers. Uh, we see a lot of multiple job holding in the arts. Uh, we also see a lot of self-employment self and contract work. You know, all of these kind of potentially negative characteristics are very common in the arts, in part because artists have this intrinsic motivation. They're willing to do the work even if the pay is not you know, what they might like. Okay. Um, and if we look at college graduates with majors in the arts or with degrees in the arts, which is the focus of this study, um, we see that a lot of college graduates that study the arts end up working in careers outside of the arts. Um, and that's likely in part because arts jobs have some of these negative characteristics. Now, this paper looks at the US healthcare context. So for those of you here that are outside of the US, I wanna give a little bit of background on the US. And here I have some data from 2021. 8.3% um, of Americans had no health insurance coverage in 2021. You know, we do not have universal health insurance coverage here in the US, which is a rarity in the developed world. Um, and if we look at those that have insurance, you know, about two thirds had private health insurance plans. Um, a little over one third of public, there's a little bit of overlap there. So don't be alarmed that those numbers don't add to 100%. Um, but a lot of private health insurance, not as much government involvement in health insurance. If we look at private health insurance in the US, um, our private healthcare system is really driven by employment. So through your job, you have health insurance coverage that comes as part of your compensation package. Uh, you know, depending on the job, uh, some employers may pay a pretty high share of premiums for health insurance. Um, some employers, it may be a much smaller share, but often you are getting your private insurance coverage through your employer, which again is different than much of the world. If we look at the remaining health insurance coverage, um, Medicaid is the health insurance program for the poor in the US. That is a public health insurance program. It's administered through the state, so there's a little bit of differences across state and you know, who is eligible um, based on like income thresholds, that sort of thing. Um, but about 
19% of those with health insurance have health insurance coverage through Medicaid. Um, then we have Medicare, which is our public health insurance program for the elderly. Um, typically those that are 65 plus in the US are eligible for Medicare coverage. Um, so just about all of our population that is that age has health insurance coverage through Medicare. And that's 18% of all persons with health insurance coverage. 10% uh, of persons are buying health insurance coverage directly. Um, that, that's private coverage, but it's not through an employer. And then there's a little bit of other here. Um, for example, uh, health insurance coverage for veterans may be purchased through the veterans administration. So a little bit of other. But again, you know, emphasis here on the fact that the U.S. is very different than a lot of other uh, contexts when it comes to health insurance. So the focus of this study um, looks at the Affordable Care Act, which was a comprehensive health care reform law enacted in 2010. This was during Barack Obama's administration. Um, you'll often hear the Affordable Care Act referred to as Obamacare. Um, in terms of some highlights, certainly going into all the details of Obamacare is beyond the scope of this presentation, but um, a couple of big things that Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act did. Um, one thing was the expansion of Medicaid coverage. Um, states had the ability to opt in or opt out to this Medicaid expansion, but for those states that opted in, which are more than half of states, the income threshold for qualifying for Medicaid was lifted. I think it went from 100% of the poverty line to maybe 137% or something along those lines. Uh, the Affordable Care Act also provided some subsidies for the purchase of health insurance um, for those that wouldn't qualify for Medicaid but were within a certain threshold of the poverty line. And then the focus of this study here is on the expansion of dependent coverage. Um, with the Affordable Care Act, the maximum age at which young adults could be covered by their parents' plans uh, was increased to 25, uh, and that coverage ends on the 26th birthday. Previously, that age was 18, unless the dependent was enrolled full-time in school, then it could potentially be higher, right? Um, but really, one of the largest groups of uninsured Americans before the Affordable Care Act were those persons um, like in their 20s, not you know too old to be on their parents' plans, but potentially you know not in jobs where they were getting employer coverage, uh, the Affordable Care Act closed the gap for a lot of young adults. So getting to the research question, um, what we look to answer in this paper is, how did the Affordable Care Act's dependent coverage expansion affect the career choices of young college graduates with degrees in the arts? And we hypothesize here that young college grads with degrees in the arts would be more likely to work as artists following the ACA's expansion. We could think of this from the perspective of a lot of existing theory on how artists behave. Um, you know, if we think of this within Throsby's work preference model, artists drive utility from time engaged in artistic creation. Artists are gonna seek to maximize their time working in the arts, subject to needing to meet some minimum level of income to survive. And there have been many extensions of this work preference model. Um, you know, notably extensions that bring in non-labor income, suggesting that non-labor income should increase time spent engaged in artistic work. If we look at how the ACA's dependent coverage expansion would then potentially impact career choices of young arts graduates, um, it should reduce the minimum income they'd need from employment to survive, you know, since they can get health insurance coverage from a parent, um, they don't need to worry that their job is providing health insurance coverage, which means that maybe they could work in the arts or spend more time creating their art rather than working elsewhere. Um, we could also think of this health insurance coverage as non-labor income. You know, and looking at the extensions of the Therazi model, more non-labor income leads to more time spent working in the arts. So again, you know, kind of the takeaway here, uh, having this health insurance coverage through a parent should open up the potential opportunity for these college grads to go and work in the arts. 
you know, and why are we looking at arts graduates? Well, you know, we're assuming that because these individuals got degrees in the arts, um, that they're potentially interested in working in the arts, right? This is a subset of college graduates that we think would have, you know, a, a likelihood to want to work in the arts, if it's possible for them financially. A little bit of discussion of literature, and we already discussed some literature previously, but um, uh, there's a 2020 paper uh, with several authors that found that the Affordable Care Act had a large impact on health insurance coverage for young artists, um, and notably a bigger impact than for other young workers, in part because the precarious nature of arts work uh, likely led to a lot of um, arts graduates not working in jobs um, with health insurance coverage or a lot of artists not having health insurance coverage. So Affordable Care Act had a big impact on health insurance coverage and bigger impact for artists than other workers. Um, and then looking at some of my own prior work in a similar paper by Albana, um, these papers looked at the impact of student loan debt uh, on working in the arts. And I had found previously that having student loan debt decreased the likelihood college graduates um, with majors in the arts were working as artists, right? And we could also think of that within this context of the work preference model. Having student debt is raising that minimum income level that you need to survive. Um, so kind of an opposite effect to what we see for the Affordable Care Act. Right? So having debt is going to decrease your likelihood of working in the arts because you need to make more money to survive. Um, Affordable Care Act, uh, by gaining health insurance coverage from your parent, you need less uh, earned employment income to survive. Right? So kind of predicting opposite effects here. So moving on to the data. Uh, for this study, we use US Census data from the American Community Survey. Uh, American Community Survey uh, surveys a 1% sample of the US population. It's a random sample. Um, the data collection is yearly. Uh, lots of questions are asked about you know, employment, education, and all sorts of things. The years we look at are 2009 to 2013. That gives us a short window before the Affordable Care Act is implemented and then a short window afterwards. Um, note that undergraduate major was first um, recorded in the American Community Survey in 2009. So we can't go back before 2009 because we don't know college majors for those persons. Um, and in terms of sampler restrictions, uh, we're restricting our analysis to those who are employed with the exception of a few regressions that you'll see in a bit. Um, college graduates, you know, those that majored in an arts field, which I'll define in a slide or two. Um, we look at ages 21 to 35, excluding 26, which is the, you know, the year in which coverage ends. So we're looking at just before and just after 26 years old. So those slightly younger, slightly older. I mean, we are excluding persons in institutionalized populations and active military personnel, which is a small share of our sample. Some definitions here for artists and also uh, our arts majors. So here's a list of the majors that are included among arts majors. And I won't go into, you know, I'm not going to read this full list to you here, but these are typically the majors that we associate with artistic occupations, creative majors here, you know, fine arts, music, photography. Um, we also include art and music education, literature and composition, so some of these creative majors. We use two different definitions of artists. Uh, the first is a more narrow definition. This aligns with the definition of the National Endowment for the Arts, um, which includes kind of traditional artist jobs that correspond to our primary arts majors, um, like artists, actors, musicians, dancers, those occupations. And then we use kind of a broader definition of arts occupations, you know, think more along the lines of like the Creative Trident model, um, where that includes NEA artists, and then some additional occupations that the American Community Survey includes them like arts and entertainment occupations. So, you know, while authors are included among National Endowment for the Arts artists, editors are not. Editors are included in the ACS arts occupation variable. Um, 
you know, actors are part of the NEA artists, but television and media equipment workers are not, those are also included in the ACS arts occupations. Um, so it's a, you know, a more complete group of occupations here. So narrow artists, kind of more extended artists, way to think of this. Um, I do want to make a note on how occupation is defined in the American Community Survey data. So respondents are only allowed to report one occupation when they are completing the American Community Survey, and they are asked to report the occupation where they are working the most hours. So if a person is working both in the arts and outside of the arts, um, they would be classified as an artist if they work more hours in the arts than out of the arts. Um, they would not be classified as an artist if they're working more hours in the other occupation. Right? So to the extent that we are seeing impacts here, it could be the case that the Affordable Care Act is pushing some workers out of non-arts work into arts work exclusively. Right? So you're going from working an administrative job to an arts job um, it could be the case that the Affordable Care Act is pushing workers into more hours in their arts work. So potentially you're still working two jobs, but before you were working 10 hours in the arts and 30 hours in an administrative role or something, now you're working 30 hours in the arts and 10 hours in the administrative role. Um, and note here that it's also possible that for some of our arts graduates, they may be increasing their level of arts work but not enough to make it the primary occupation, right? We could see for some workers, you know, maybe before they're working 10 hours in the arts and 30 hours in an administrative role, after the Affordable Care Act, now they're working 15 hours or 20 hours in the arts, but it's not enough to be their primary occupation. So that is something to note. The effects we are observing are effects on the share of arts graduates um, whose primary occupation is uh, an arts occupation. So something to at least think about. Um, I give a table of descriptive statistics. And again, I'm not gonna read through these numbers for you here, but a few things I'll note. You know, just under 90% of our workers have health insurance coverage. Um, in terms of the share working in arts occupations, with that broader definition, um, that's between about 17%. With the more narrow definition, it's about 14%. So a lot of arts graduates work outside of the arts. Um, otherwise, our treatment and control groups, the under 26, over 26, look pretty similar. Um, I will note, of course, the older part of the sample, um, they're more likely to be married, which is not surprising. Um, also more likely to have a master's degree or higher, again, not surprising. Otherwise, these two groups look similar. As for our empirical approach um, to test for the impact of the Affordable Care Act, we're gonna use difference and differences. Um, and we'll present simple difference and difference tables and then also difference and difference regression results. We are comparing those just under 26 and those just over 26. Um, and then we're comparing them before the Affordable Care Act and after the Affordable Care Act. So this is a pre-policy, post-policy comparison for those just under and those just over 26 years old. You might ask, why do we not just compare those under and over 26 after the ACA? Well, it's certainly the case that getting older could impact career choices um, and also health insurance coverage, right? So we don't wanna just compare after ACA, those under and over 26. And you could ask, why not just compare young artists pre and post ACA? Well, there could be other things happening during this time period. Um, notably, the Great Recession happened in 2008, 2009, right? So we're coming out of the Great Recession, going into an economic recovery during this period, right? Um, so by doing difference and differences, you know, we're able to account for factors that are, you know, related to time that are affecting both groups, and then also factors. Um, you know, that are affecting um, related to the, the policy at the same time, right? So we're, we're covering both of those bases in some sense. 
before I jump into the impacts on uh, career choices, I do just want to you know, present this table showing that health insurance coverage was in fact affected. So here we see differences pre and post ACA um, in health insurance coverage between treatment and control groups. Note before the Affordable Care Act, those 21 to 25 were much less likely to have health insurance coverage, you know, almost eight percentage points. After the Affordable Care Act, those under 26 are actually more likely to have coverage by about three percentage points. Uh, the difference in difference here between these you know, two groups, treatment control pre-post, is just over 10 percentage points. Right? Um, so a quantitatively quite large impact of the Affordable Care Act on health insurance coverage. Right? And that had been observed previously in the literature. Um, now looking at the simple difference in difference tables for our arts occupation variables. Um, what I'm going to point out here is that Looking at the control groups so of those over 26, very little change in the likelihood of working in an arts occupation pre-Affordable Care Act, post-Affordable Care Act, and we shouldn't see a change there. But for the treatment group, there's a quite large change. Right, We're going from just under 15% to uh, over 17%. This difference in difference here of 2.54 percentage points, right? Um, that's a pretty big increase, you know, relative to this pre-period mean for the treatment group, you know, a 15 to 20% increase, right? So before the Affordable Care Act, treatment group was significantly less likely to be working in an arts occupation. After the Affordable Care Act, they're actually slightly more likely to be working in an arts occupation. Right? so at least the raw differences show a pretty big impact. Um, and that's the same for our NEA artists also. Right, again, not a big difference pre post for the control group, pretty big difference pre post for the treatment group. Um, you know, if we compare treatment and control pre, pretty big difference, compare treatment and control post, no difference at all. Again, that's, you know, about a 20 percentage, or a 20 percent difference relative to that pre period mean. So, pretty big impacts. For the regression models, we're presenting linear probability models, though note that if we use logistic regression, the results are unchanged. And all of these models have heteroscedasticity or bus standard errors clustered on the state. The controls we include in these regression models um, include demographic controls, uh, educational controls, and some geographic controls. And I won't read through those for you, but a lot of the standard controls you'd expect in um, regression models here. So here is our primary results table. This gives the difference in difference regression results. Uh, we do present results first for that health insurance coverage. And again, uh, we're focused here on this post-treatment interaction. So this is the difference in difference effect. And notice, you know, more than a 10 percentage point impact on health insurance coverage. Um, and if we look at the likelihood of working in the arts, um, the Affordable Care Act, you know, increased the likelihood of working in an arts occupation or as an NEA artist by over two percentage points, um, which are, you know, quantitatively large impacts relative to the mean. Those are all statistically significant with P less than 0.01. So big impacts uh, in line with what we expected. We then go through a series of robustness checks. Um, the first robustness check uh, looks at impacts on employment. So one potential counter argument here is that um, the Affordable Care Act's dependent coverage expansion could lead some arts graduates to leave the workforce. Maybe some arts graduates were working simply to have health insurance coverage. Um, and now that they could get it through their parent, um, they don't need to work anymore. If it's the case that more arts graduates working outside of the arts were leaving the workforce than those that were working inside of the arts, maybe our denominator's changing while our numerator's not really changing and that could be driving effects. We run some regressions to test for this. If that were the case, we'd expect this post-treatment treatment interaction for these employment regressions to be negative. Um, what we see here, these effects are positive but insignificant. So no impacts on employment. 
So that counter argument doesn't seem to hold weight. Um, another useful robustness check is to look at the type of insurance coverage. Now, the dependent coverage expansion allowed young adults to gain access through their parents' employer plans. So we should only observe effects um, for arts graduates with employer health insurance coverage, right? There's no reason if you're getting uh, coverage through Medicaid, for example, that there should be any impact on your uh, decision. The Affordable Care Act was only affecting um, you know, those employer plans so with the dependent coverage. And what we see here is if we break up the results by type of insurance, uh, you know, big significant uh, impacts for those with employer insurance. If we look at those with other insurance types or no insurance at all, uh, those effects are negative but insignificant. So no effect for other insurance or no insurance, big positive impacts of post-treatment for those with employer insurance. You know, again, suggesting that it was this dependent coverage expansion that's driving the effects that we observe. And then the last robustness check that I'm gonna show here in this presentation um, focuses on other college graduates, right? Um, you know, our argument at the start here is that it's the nature of artistic work that's driving the effect that we see for arts majors. Um, you know, because our arts majors are, you know, intrinsically motivated and also because uh, work in the arts is often um, precarious, right? Less health insurance coverage, lower pay. Um, we shouldn't see similar effects for graduates of other majors, right? So we present some results for other majors, you know, business majors, engineering majors, computer math and stats and education here, right? There's no reason to think that the Affordable Care Act is going to drive more business majors to work in business, right? Um, for business majors, working in business, business jobs are likely to provide health insurance coverage anyway, right? Um, and we see no effect for business majors. Same thing with engineering majors. Again, engineering jobs are likely to provide health insurance coverage, right? And probably high earnings relative to other things engineering majors could do. Again, no effect here for engineering majors. Same for math and stats uh, majors, computer math and stats majors, not more likely to work in computer and math occupations. Um, similarly for education majors, we actually see a small negative impact here, uh, marginally significant, but again, no positive impact like we see for arts majors. So really this is a phenomenon that is unique to our arts graduates, consistent with what we think, you know, of arts uh, graduates behaving differently in our theoretical models. Um, so coming along to conclusions, and I see I'm doing okay here on time. Um, overall, we see that the dependent coverage expansion led to an increase in coverage for arts graduates. Um, and this increase in coverage led to an increase uh, in the likelihood that arts graduates are working in the arts. Again, more than two percentage points, which is a big impact, you know, relative to the, the mean for uh, our treatment group in the pre-period, right? Talking 15 to 20 percent uh, impacts. So big impacts. Um, kind of the takeaway here is that policies that can help to alleviate labor market precarity um, can allow more arts graduates to work in the arts. And again, our focus here is on arts graduates, but such policies likely allow more labor market flexibility to workers in other fields too, right? So again, focus here on the arts, but such policies are likely to have positive impacts potentially on other fields also. And then before I turn this over to our discussant, um, I do wanna you know, highlight some avenues for future inquiry or potential future inquiry here related to this work. You know, we might ask, do the effects persist over the longer term, right? So was it the case that um, the likelihood of working in the arts increased for those under 26 um, just in the period while they're on their parents' health insurance coverage? Or do we see those effects persisting over the longer term, right? If we look at that same group of graduates 10 years later, um, are they still more likely to work in the arts or is it something that only you know, affects them while they're on their parents' plan? Um, so I think that's an interesting follow-up question here. 
And as we get further removed from the Affordable Care Act, that's a policy question that could be um, answered with data. We might ask how the policy affected marginalized populations in the arts. Uh, we know already that arts graduates are predominantly white and from higher socioeconomic status backgrounds. Um, this policy, the Affordable Care Act, can affect your career choice if your parents don't work jobs that provide employer health insurance, right? So it's possible that the Affordable Care Act is affecting um, arts graduates from, you know, more privileged backgrounds. If your parents don't have health insurance coverage, you're not getting coverage through an employer plan following the dependent coverage expansion. And then a third potential possibility for future inquiry here um, is to look at how the policy affected non-college graduates. Um, and we can imagine that non-college graduates that, you know, want to work in the arts or, you know, artists without degrees in the arts are probably also more likely to work in the arts following the policy change. Again, the focus here of this study was on arts graduates because that's a nice well-defined group that we know might want to work in the arts. Um, but it's very possible that others that want to work in the arts that don't have college degrees were also affected. And I think trying to look at those effects could also be uh, insightful. All right, and that's all I've got. So I'm gonna turn it over at this point to our discussion and open up to other questions. Thank you very much, Richard. Now I would like to invite uh, Marianne Quacqua from Americans for the Art uh, uh, to start the discussion about this very interesting presentation. Thanks. So thank you, Richard, um, for the presentation um, and for inviting me to be a discussant, um, you know, for this paper, uh, because you did such an excellent job um, on the background. A lot of my um, comments were also to try to give context um, to, you know, some of, you know, what the kind of um, healthcare context is within the United States and um, how this paper contributes to that, but I'll kind of um, move through those a bit more quickly um, and just speak broadly about, you know, the contributions to the literature, um, a little bit more about uh, the main findings, um, the strengths of the methodology, um, and then some of the kind of implications before moving into some questions. Um, I So, First thing to note um, in terms of just uh, my background, so Americans for the Arts is um, a national advocacy organization that specifically supports local arts agencies and arts advocates um, through um, policy um, and, and trying to increase um, arts related uh, policy um, and allocation specifically at the federal level. Um, and so we dabble in a lot of work related to the creative economy in this um, paper is um, interesting in that it's adding to a lot of literature that seeks to understand um, the nature of that. Um, in terms of the contributions to the literature, um, it perhaps goes without saying, um, but this paper is contributing in, in that it really focuses on, you know, arts graduates in particular and, and young arts um, uh, arts graduates. So in bringing, you know, the paper speaks a little bit about, um, you know, how there have been previous attempts to, to figure out, you know, who does end up working in these arts occupations um, and that, the, you know, there is recent research, you know, finding that, um, these graduates tend to be white male, have advanced degrees. Um, and then as uh, Richard mentioned, he had recent research out um, in terms of uh, those who tend to get into these occupations also have no or low uh, levels of student debt. So really I thought in, in reading this paper that what was interesting about it was this kind of conceptualization of the expansion um, of coverage as being um, over, almost a, a, a form of non-labor income and the way in which the paper seeks to really understand the impact of the coverage in those terms. Um, so just to kind of break down that theory a bit more, um, you know, Richard already's to discuss the work preference model. Um, but I think this is kind of interesting, the assumptions here about non-labor income, um, increasing the time spent engaged um, in artistic work and trying to figure out whether or not um, specifically working in arts, arts occupations is covering that um, idea that there is time being spent engaged in artistic work. Um, I also think that um, as you know, Richard, mentioned, uh, the, the really interesting thing about this is also this idea that the coverage is happening under a parent's plan. So trying to conceptualize this and 
you know, there is conversation within the paper about decreasing dependence um, and whether or not this is another form of thinking through how um, does health insurance decrease dependence on the overall economy and what are the effects of that? Um, and I have a, a couple comments at the end in terms of um, you know, thinking through uh, this from the lens, possibly thinking of, about this through the lens of decommodification de and whether or not that would add a little bit more to uh, what you were trying to discuss in terms of the overall effect for arts graduates. Um, I also think it's important to mention that um, the strength of this, in terms of one of the strengths of this paper is that um, a lot of the extant research currently finds that um, dependent uh, coverage policy does not have an effect. So uh, it's really important to note um, that the kind of the overall finding that um, this coverage did impact the career choices of arts graduates shouldn't be um, kind of taken lightly, that that is a, a an advancement in this specific part of the, of the literature about how health insurance affects um, job candidates. Um, I also uh, so wanted to mention again and bring up this uh, Sony Friedman and Simon paper um, that focuses on how uh, the health insurance coverage amongst artists in particular um, expanded because of the ACA um, and just noting that this is a, another way of kind of confirming some of those findings. Um, I So Richard has already talked about some of the robustness checks, and so I also won't go through those in great detail, but wanted to emphasize that last one that he spoke about um, related to how does this compare to other sorts of arts graduates. Um, so I found that to be a particularly strong part of this in showing that there's something unique about, again, the precarious nature of arts um, jobs and wondering whether or not, again, there could be a little bit um, more spoken to, um, you know, how do arts graduates, um, the multiple sorts of jobs that arts graduates have. So um, emphasizing again that, um, you know, when it comes to um, when it comes to arts graduates, there is something unique about um, their um, occupational choices. And I think that that is a good way of showing it in comparison to some of the other sorts of groups. Um, so just to move then a little bit more into the implications um, and the suggestions that were discussed in the paper as well. Um, so just to reiterate that the main finding here really uh, was that the results of uh, the results of the research indicate that the dependent coverage expansion increased the likelihoods that arts majors were working in arts occupations. I also think that there's ways to kind of think through um, whether or not, you know, these definitions really capture um, that entirely? Is it really that they're working as artists or are they working um, within kind of creative economy jobs? It might be a slight distinction, but again, I know you talked about the NEA having that more restricted um, definition, but I think some of the theoretical underpinnings that you speak about in terms of intrinsic motivation um, could relate specifically to one group of artists versus the other a little more strongly, and it might be worth um, teaching using that out um, a bit more as well. Um, I also wanted to note, uh, for those of you did, that didn't uh, read the paper, that it, so the impacts were really driven by those with employer insurance, and again, restricted, restricted to those were, who were employed. Um, so as Richard talked about, kind of the new avenues would really seek to see um, what percentage of our of the population who are artists, again, don't have those degrees and what do their kind of um, occupational trends look like. Uh, I also think that, so a, a big thought that came to mind as well is kind of thinking about the unique advantages that um, the dependent coverage affords to those with, again, traditional family structures. Um, so thinking through, um, you know, what does this prerequisite in terms of having parents with health insurance um, truly mean? And I know that you mentioned that at the end, but I wanted you to speak a little bit through what are the research studies that we would need to see um, happen in the future to really tease that out and to understand whether or not there's a higher percentage of those sorts of um, individuals working in these um, working in these occupations and what are the implications of that? Um, then related to the point that I talked about in terms of decommodification, I thought it would be really interesting to maybe add 
that into this conversation in terms of thinking about worker reliance on spousal and employer benefits. That one of the premises of this paper and why it was so interesting is trying to show that um, you know through this coverage there was able to be a decrease in this worker reliance on specifically spousal and employer benefits um, for young artists. Um, but some might also argue that this coverage also increased reliance on, on parental figures. And so trying to figure out how does that increase in reliance on parental figures factor into some of this um, in terms of, you know, how, um, how does the consistency of um, a parent's job affect the life choices or um, the occupation, no choices of their children and how can changes within their um, insurance then end up affecting these, this group um, in the long term? Um, which also goes to, to say that, you know, in this presentation, I was happy to see that you um, added a lot of information about, or a lot of, but like, uh, recent information about the kind of U.S. healthcare context and wanting to maybe see a little bit more of that in the literature review to also kind of help um, keep in mind that that healthcare context is very important um, when we're talking about that dependent coverage um, for students. Um, I also wondered if there, you know, were any sort of kind of ne negative externalities of, that were associated with this dependent coverage um, at all, and if that, if there's any way that that could be explored or brought into um, further conversations, um, and that do we, you know, we see this effect for these young students, but as you mentioned, does it persist beyond, um, you know, 26, and then are there other negative um, things that happen in terms of their ability to find arts jobs that um, have health insurance? Um, um, because they are now dependent on this, uh, you know, uh, uh, on on their parents for health insurance. Any anything along those lines, I think, could be very interesting to explore moving forward. Um, and then also wanted to note that the paper um, suggests you know, a lot of policy implications in terms of, you know, how can we help artists um, gain, um, you know, access to health insurance? And so it was mentioned, for example, there might be. Um, you know, a possibility for inclusion within artist guilds, specifically was mentioned the Screen Art Actors Guild as a possibility. And so also trying to think about, you know, what are, what are the difference between the sorts of policies that are, um, the sorts of policies that are provided through groups like that, membership in groups, artist guilds or unions compared to this dependent coverage um, and whether or not we see any effects um, for, artists of that age that are a member of those um, guilds and, you know, how could we figure out more information about that to kind of add um, to this paper and other work that could come out of this paper. Um, so that's just at a very high level, some of the things like I, I wanted to mention again and just underscore how um, robust the effects are and, and, and how big the effects are, um, specifically because um, the percentage of people that noted that they were working um, as artists were such a small percentage. And so really just underscoring um, the strength of that within this paper too, to show that this was unique to artists and young artists and that the effects are, are very real. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and then I had a few questions and I also saw uh, one pop up in the chat. Um, but I really wanted to start by asking you, Richard, if you could just talk a little bit more about the unique challenges um, that uh, yourself and um, Rajendra uh, perhaps um, also faced in trying to categorize the, the occupations of arts graduates. I know you talk about that in the paper, but just wondered if you could discuss that a bit. Uh, yeah, we definitely did our best to follow the literature in terms of those categorizations. Um, though I recognize that categorizations are a bit imperfect. Um, you know, it, certainly I think something that's come to the literature in terms of like, you know, what are our artist occupations? You know, we leave out arts education occupations. And there have been folks that have suggested, you know, arts education occupations are arts occupations. Right? Um, that is something we don't include, but it's something that we considered including or could include. Um, yeah, I mean, otherwise, you know, we follow the literature, certainly the National Endowment for the Arts definition is a nice definition, um, but it's a very limited definition. You know, we liked doing the that extended definition that included the, for, uh, the American Community Surveys kind of list of arts and entertainment occupations. Um, 
but there are definitely occupations that could potentially be there that aren't in that group. So yeah, I, I think that's an important question and it's something that we struggled with a bit. You know, we opted to follow the literature and some of those definitions, but you know, even within the literature, there's a ton of debate as to what should be counted, what shouldn't be counted. And also just to go off of that a little bit, um, do you think that there would have been a difference in what you found if you were relying on data that was self-report data in terms of people who say, I work in an artistic discipline or I am an artist, regardless of kind of what job that they have, what occupation that they have on paper, if you could just speak about that a little. Um, potentially. Yeah, I mean, uh, the student loan paper that I'd written previously, um, I used a different data set for that. And the data set I used for that paper, um, there is both a self-reported question and kind of a, an occupation question. So within that paper, I looked at impact of student loan debt on career choices. I considered both a measure of like an artist occupation, um, but also a self-reported how closely related is your job to your field or your like major field from college. Um, and I found similar results for both phrasings of the question. So I found big impacts for working in arts occupations and also big impacts for self-reported, how closely related is your job to work in the arts. But within that paper, if you look at the jobs that people said were closely related to their degree, there were some jobs um, like in healthcare fields that artists felt were closely related. And maybe that is things like art or music therapy that we might think, but, you know, there's not granularity within the ACS occupations to say, you know, is your therapy job art or music therapy? That might be really an arts job hidden as a health job. Um, so I don't think there'd be necessarily, I, I think the effects would be fairly consistent, um, but the definitions would probably lead to very different groups of occupations. Yeah. Um, another question that I had was, you know, what can this research tell us about, um, if anything, why access to health insurance was having this effect as opposed to, let's say, training or funding, um, anything along those lines? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'd like to think there are lots of things that could matter. You know, I think the student loan paper, you know, that elimination seemed to matter health insurance in this paper seems to matter. Yeah, you know, I think really anything that is affecting, you know, potentially non-labor income or, you know, affecting really the need for income for artists could matter. Um, and, and I'm curious to see, you know, what papers are in the future that look at other potential sources of non-labor income, you know, that, it, there's bound to be something that comes out of this, you know, pause in student debt payments related to the arts, because I think there's going to be an effect there. Might be too early to see in the data, but I think there's likely an effect there. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, any source of non labor income could matter, but sometimes it's hard to capture non labor income in the data. You know, certainly we have good information on health insurance coverage. Um, the American Community Survey and other bigger data sources don't always ask the questions we might want them to ask. Uh, though there are data sources like uh, SNAP that do ask you know, some more granular questions, um, the benefit to using census data as opposed to SNAP data is we can compare artists to non-artists. Um, there's also the random sample piece there too, but I think there's a lot we can learn with SNAP data where we we in the arts community have more control over figuring out what questions go into that survey. You know, we have little control over what the census decides to ask, for sure. Right, and just to go off of that a little bit too, I mean, what you talk about using the um, American Community Survey for specific, you know, specific reasons that you just mentioned, but um, what were the other data sources that you kind of came up about as you were thinking about doing this paper? And if you discuss a little bit of what the strengths of using this data versus some of those other sources might've been. Um, certainly I thought about SNAP. Um, I've used the National Survey of College Graduates before too. Um, really the big strength of the American Community Survey is just that big sample size. Uh, it's, it's hard to find other sources that have such a large sample size. And if you're looking at, you know, artists or arts majors are a small subset of the population, 
and focusing on young artists is an even smaller subset, you really need a data set with a pretty large sample size to start to be able to look at some of these more granular questions. So I think really the biggest advantage of the American Community Survey is just it's so much bigger than these other data sources. Um, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And, th and then also just what sorts of questions would you have wanted to see that could have helped you um, kind of make this case a bit more just for future research or other things? Like what sorts of questions would you be looking for? I mean, definitely any sort of self-reported measures of, you know, there, there are plenty of arguments, you know, there are reasons to think that many of these arts graduates that are not working in the arts are wanting to not work in the arts. There's a lot of recent literature on arts entrepreneurship, um, you know, contributions of arts graduates to entrepreneurship and innovation generally in the economy. Um, certainly plenty of arts graduates want to go into education. Um, so you know, there's no reason to think that these, you know, young arts graduates had a change of heart pre and post ACA, um, but it, it would be interesting to know, you know, why are these arts graduates not working in the arts? And is it because of, you know, financial limitations or better benefits in other occupations? Kind of completing the story there with the self-reported description of why they're making the choices they're making would really, really help to strengthen I think, the argument here. And what can you say about how the, you know, availability of arts jobs um, factors into this picture at all in terms of not only the decision making, but then also the likelihood that, you know, young arts graduates would pursue arts occupations in general? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's another good point. Um, you know, we try within the regressions to control for, you know, state of residence, we control for state unemployment rates. Um, but ultimately, yeah, there is some question here of supply and demand. Um, there's not a reason to think that, you know, the young arts graduates are going to face a different supply scenario than uh, older arts graduates in the same state necessarily. But I think kind of a, a longer term implication of this question is, okay, great, in the short term, these arts grads are more likely to work in the arts, but they're probably displacing other arts grads, right? Our young arts grads displacing older arts grads. You know, what is kind of the net effect on artistic employment? You know, is this driven by self-employment? Do we see more, more artists deciding to you know, be self-employed, which means maybe they're not displacing older arts graduates, or are they moving into, you know, arts jobs that are not self-employed, so there is displacement? Yeah. These are kind of big, important questions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I just, it had me thinking a bit about because you have those comparison groups of also, you know, um, 27 to 35, I think. Um, and so this kind of idea of as we're looking at labor market trends, if there are people that are staying in their positions longer for X, Y, and Z reasons, or specifically there's a greater preference for, um, let's say, experience um, within these spaces, like how that can also affect um, the kind of the availability of arts jobs and whether or not having that extra health insurance or not will have as large of an effect if we see those things and those trends start to increase. But yeah, I, I think it's an interesting kind of implication or extension of this work. Perhaps if we have time, I would like also to collect a couple of questions from the audience uh, yes. before we end. Uh, yeah. I want to make one quick point and then I'll hit the audience. Please. Um, there was the comment on, you know, increased reliance on parental, you know, support, um, which I think is a good point. There's a lot of data to suggest that younger generations are more likely to cut off contact with their parents than the older generations were. Um, you know, where if we're, you know, the dependent coverage expansion means you need to have contact with your parents probably to be on their health insurance plan. Um, so I don't know if it's necessarily a good thing you know, with our current generations that, you know, the way to work an arts job is to stay on your parents' health plan, right? And I think the broader solution is more so a Medicare for all or something where there's no reliance on anyone other than the government's providing health insurance. Um, it's kind of an imperfect solution, but I just wanted to bring up that point. Yeah, audience questions. I do see one here in the well, chat. Well, actually, yeah, actually, uh, this is uh, an amazing discussion and uh, we could uh, continue for hours because, and uh, thank you so much for raising so in, so many interesting uh, points for further uh, investigation. 
there is one aspect about your current research that has be that has attracted the uh, the attention that is uh, uh, the fact that you are comparing two different groups of age, uh, and uh, you uh, you study uh, a similar impact uh, uh, on the two uh, groups of age. Um, so, in connection with that, there is a, a methodological as uh, a question, which is: uh, um, Are you worried about uh, these parallel trends? Uh, uh, being studied in the two groups. Uh, and there is also, from my side, um, uh, a, a, a meaning a, a, a question, which is uh, evidence uh, shows a higher selection at the beginning of the career. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, uh, it would be interesting also uh, to study the impact, the possible impact of the ACA uh, on uh, uh, older courts uh, of artists. So what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, very good points. Um, in terms of parallel trends, uh, you know, we see a very brief parallel trend in nine and 10 before afterwards. We can't go before 2009 because of data limitations. We don't know major before 2009. Um, I will say that if we compare say 25 to 27 or like a smaller window around 26, we find similar results. Um, we, we do a bigger window for the sake of sample size. You know, as we get smaller around 26, we, we start to lose significance because our sample size gets too small, but the effects stay the same. Um, so definitely, you know, the effect seems to be that cutoff, uh, which I think, you know, strengthens our findings. And, you know, the other of us in check, the fact that it's driven by employer insurance, I think is kind of the big one suggesting that what we're seeing is what we think we're seeing. But those are good points. Uh, certainly, you know, comparing a 21-year-old to a 35-year-old is not the, the greatest comparison, for sure. Um, and perhaps we have uh, uh, a little time for the very last question, uh, uh, still from the chat, uh, that is asking whether you are thinking to apply the same uh, analysis uh, uh, to compare uh, different groups uh, uh, of uh, of the population that uh, would be interesting, for instance, uh, uh, in order to expand uh, to the European case, uh, where there are different uh, types of uh, of uh, at, at insurance coverage, uh, public and private, etc. So I am not currently planning that similar analysis, but I think I think that's a good point. Um, you know, I, I think if there's a, a next paper to come out of, you know, this line of inquiry, it might be looking at the longer term impacts, you know, looking 10 years out, you know, do those effects persist. Um, but yeah, those are those are big, important questions. We had thought about looking at the, the Medicaid piece, you know, looking at older graduates with the Medicaid expansion piece. Um, there, uh, the effect sizes are just too small. The impact on coverage is just too small. The, the nice thing about looking at dependent coverage was that's a huge impact on health insurance coverage, you know, 10 percentage point impact there. Um, I think the impact on uh, the Medicaid expansion was like a couple of percentage points at most. So for that to then bleed into career choices, it'd be really hard to find those effects. All right. Uh, unfortunately, the seminar is coming to an end because our hour has uh, passed very, very quickly. Uh, so uh, finally, we had a very interesting example of, of how uh, economic analysis uh, uh, can bring evidence uh, to support uh, the impact of policy making. And it was uh, so interesting, uh, such an interesting discussion. So we would like to thank uh, very much Richard Paulson, our presenter of today from Bloomsburg uh, University, as well as our uh, uh, discussant uh, Marianne Quacqua from Americans for the Arts. Uh, and I would like to invite you and of course uh, the audience for their very interesting questions. Uh, and I would like to invite you uh, to our next uh, Cultural Economics online seminar in uh, four weeks uh, sharps uh, on Tuesday, 4, uh, 14 November at 9 a.m. Uh, GMT, so please uh, mark your calendars uh, with another interesting uh, presentation. And of course, uh, feel free uh, to send me a little email if you would like to contribute with the presentation to the CEOs. 
thank you so much and have a nice rest of the day, of the afternoon, of the evening, whatever. Thank you. Bye. Bye.